Now, as we began to dig into the subject of infrastructure, uh, it was very hard at first to find uh, examples of where deficiencies in infrastructure uh, were, uh, were commonplace. That's not the case anymore. Almost on a weekly basis, we see where problems are emerging with our infrastructure that are really creating bottlenecks. Uh, highway, railway, waterway uh, blockages are, are keeping crops that could be exported on the ground, in many cases spoiling. Uh, energy from renewable and fossil resources in the, in the heartland can't get to the large metro centers where the demand is because we don't have the transmission. Wireless telecom uh, isn't what it could be yet. Uh, you can drop a call, unfortunately, in many places. Uh, but we also need those high-speed optical networks that the universities and high-end users uh, really need. Uh, another thing about uh, uh, many parts of the heartland is the electric power grid, as in many urban areas, is woefully inadequate. Uh, Joel and I were in a community in uh, uh, a part of the heartland last week where they have a very advanced membrane uh, manufacturing facility that does uh, filtration of very complex products. They have to shut down occasionally because the electric system just can't handle it. So not a good way to build an advanced economy if you can't even keep the lights on and your, your machinery going. And then like uh, their urban counterparts, uh, second and third tier cities, uh, very small towns, uh, have a backlog of uh, infrastructure improvements that they need to make and they have unmet future needs and I, I know that uh, Mayor Donahue uh, will talk about that. So we all know that infrastructure is on everybody's radar screen today. It's the number one problem. It's everybody's solution. We got a tremendous challenge. I think the uh, estimate is $1.6 trillion of work to do. Uh, we're aware of these proposals at the uh, federal level for an infrastructure bank, a bonds program, development corporations. Uh, we also know that uh, states have infrastructure funds and public authorities that they're talking about. And then we're also seeing the, uh, the springing up of private infrastructure investment funds around the world. And uh, those have really taken off in recent uh, years uh, because investors are now seeing that as an asset class uh, that has an attractive risk-adjusted return on investment. That's kind of the phrase I hear whenever I talk to, uh, uh, to the investment funds. Uh, we're also finding around the world, and uh, here's where the United States is a little bit behind the curve, uh, that public-private partnerships uh, to finance infrastructure are uh, relatively common elsewhere, uh, just beginning to emerge here, because government simply cannot do it alone anymore. Government's not going to be able to afford uh, to do this. So this is kind of the origins of the Heartland Development Bank, and uh, as we began to look at it, uh, we really thought about it as a bank that would uh, 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 help to uh, enhance our competitiveness and promote economic growth. Uh, the model that we uh, first looked at was to uh, structure it some like, somewhat like the International Development Bank, where you had a variety of public and private investors uh, that would come to the table. 5% uh, of the capital would be paid in, the remaining would be called in uh, when there were deals to do. But the primary thing that we were looking for to do is to create a mechanism that would invest in infrastructure uh, in parts of the country that have been traditionally overlooked, as uh, both Cheryl and uh, Joel have remarked. Now, I'm not complaining. I really am not because part of the problem is we haven't put those mechanisms in place ourselves uh, to actually get the investment. So uh, we need to be more proactive and uh, take the initiative. 